Well, maybe you're like me. I always look forward to the, uh, the Olympics. And this year it's in Paris and man, I just have these memories of gathering around with brothers and gathering around with family and watching the opening ceremonies. And I actually missed it this year, but quickly heard a lot about it. And um, I missed it. I was coming back from Canada and fishing, which thank you very much. It was awesome. But I'll tell you, it, it was amazing because normally what we see with the opening ceremonies is we see uh, just a, a group of athletes from one country after the another in, in a processional of celebration of their unique culture. Um, we celebrate the unique culture, but we're all kind of together and there's unity and it's just a big, huge, warm, fuzzy, right? And in these opening ceremonies, there's also a lot of creativity and usually the host team kind of, the host country kind of shows off their flair of creativity. And this year though, if you were watching uh, you might have been watching with a kid and, and you saw a little bit of a different, a different ceremony this year. It, it might have been a little shocking because it was a celebration of basically a family that is not God's definition of family. It was a celebration of sex that is not God's definition of sex. It was a celebration of a counterculture, a counterfeit life that secular humanism has been ushering in for quite some time now, but I think many of us were shocked to see it so boldly paraded in front of us in the penultimate moment of really just the celebration of an alternate lifestyle was where there was a drag queen, some of y'all missed this, there was a drag queen uh, fashion runway show, and before the runway, before the models came out, basically you had a lineup at a table of these drag queens and they were positioned as the Lord's Supper. And so there they were lined up, positioned perfectly for, as the Lord's Supper and you can even see a side by side. They tried to say, oh no, it was a Dionysian feast. Yeah, whatever. And it's clearly the director, the producer was making a statement. And that statement was not lost throughout the whole thing. And, and there's been incredible outrage. And I'm actually grateful for the outrage. Uh, there's been in, uh, incredible outrage and people were greatly offended. And they're mostly offended. The thing that I'm hearing the most about is the Lord's Supper moment because it was such a direct assault on something that is so sacred to you know, over a billion people on this Sunday. Outrage is an appropriate emotion. Offense would be an appropriate emotion. But I want to take us to kind of a next level. And I want to take us beyond outrage and before, beyond offense. And, and, and I want to take this to, to a point that I think we need to be at at Keystone Church, and I believe the whole Christian church should be, and that is the audacity to make those statements on such a global stage reveals something we have been talking about here at Keystone Church, that there is a current in our culture that is counterfeiting the things of God. You have a Lord's Supper, well, let's show a counterfeit Lord's Supper. You have what God defines as love, well, let's parade what we define as love. <clears throat> Here's what intimacy looks like. Let's counterfeit it and show what what our intimacy looks like. And the message I have for us is not, we're not just gonna high five each other in our outrage. I wanna talk to us, church. Here's our message. Wake up. Wake up. We gotta move beyond outrage to an understanding of what is happening in our culture and particularly when it comes to our families. Yes, in our families. We are starting a brand new series, a three-week series called Legacy that last. It's all about family. And whatever age you're at, whatever stage that you're in, the reality is God has legacy for you with your family. Maybe you don't have kids yet. God has legacy for your future family. Whatever your family is today, he has a powerful, beautiful picture he wants to paint. But the reality is, as you just shared, is we're in a battle. 
There is resistance to God's design. There is resistance to God himself. There is resistance to God's family. And we're gonna talk about that because we as Christ followers want to be empowered to carry out God's plan and legacy for our homes. But the reality we often see, maybe it's in your house, I know it's been in our house, is sometimes rather than fighting for our family, we fight each other. And we wanna call us as a church to fight for our families. We've got to fight for what God has created, and he's called us to fight. There's a precedent of this in Nehemiah chapter 4. We're not the first people. We're not the first of God's people to fight for family. We'd encourage you to read Nehemiah a little more closely, and, and we do this every week. We kind of give you assignments, you know, and, and there's going to be a lot of assignments out of today's talk, but Nehemiah is a wonderful story for your life, and God put it there for your life. And Nehemiah was building a wall. He was repairing a wall in Jerusalem, and he encountered a lot of hostility to what he was doing. He was doing the Lord's work, and people around him did not like it. So in verse 14, here's what we see. And I looked, and I arose, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters, fight for your wives and your homes. And when I hear these words, it's so inspiring to me. And it's just this, wake up for your daughters, wake up for your sons, wake up for your wife, wake up for your husband, wake up for your family. Because if we're not awake, we're gonna wake up one day and be startled and how things are not moving in the right direction. We wanna equip you. We have a, a book that we've written, A Legacy That Lasts. In that book, we're basically, over the next three weeks, taking from that book. But also, we have a parenting conference this next uh, weekend, Friday and Saturday. We're partnering with EXO Marriage and Parenting, and we're, ho we're hosting a parenting conference. And we just encourage you, take every opportunity to equip your family. Take every opportunity. You say, well, I'm single. Um, well, do you want to have a family one day? Well, you've got to architect the family you want because the family you want will dictate the person that you date. Amen, anybody? It's gonna, you, you don't marry somebody that has a totally alternate vision and think they're just going to come around. That's right. So we've got to take all that very, very seriously. And, and kind of a, an image I want to give you that I've talked about before is posture. I, just confession, I... I struggle with my posture, and I hate this about me. I don't hate me, but I hate this about me. Anybody with me on that? You got these things, these blind spots, things that you want to work on, and I don't know what it is. I had someone try to encourage me in the lobby. So I think they thought I was sad. I'm not sad. I just want to work on it. Um, but they were like, hey, you know what? You're doing all right. It's just because you've been praying so much. Thank you. They said, so sweet. So sweet. I'm like, there's a lot of pastors who pray that don't have posture problems. But anyway, but I, you know, and I, I'll, I'll see myself in a picture. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> and so I've asked Susan, total permission. I've asked my kids, total permission. Man, get all up in my grill. Help me out. Talk to me. And she's very faithful in her assignment. <laughs> I'm a helpmate. That's, that's <laughs> my assignment. very faithful in her assignment. Will you sing your song? <clears throat> huh? Sing your song. Okay, so this is a song I've taught my kids posture, but I need to help myself. I learned this in first grade at Lake Highlands Elementary School in Dallas. In choir. So I now share it with you. Backbone straight and chest held high. Chinny chin down, here's the reason why. Organ pipes and singers too must be straight so the sound comes through. I even follow some, some accounts that that help you with your posture. I send them to you. I bought all these crazy contraptions that make me look so silly. But here's the deal. What I've learned is posture is about engaging your body. Yeah. Yeah. And you engage your body to the point that your body develops memory and you begin to, and so you teach your kids, throw those shoulders back. You teach, you engage your core. You teach, and it just, you're engaging things. And that's what we wanna do for you. Some of us, this is your posture towards your family. And we want to engage, throw those shoulders back, get in tension, ignite your core. Let's develop some muscle memory so that you, without even thinking about it, you've got a sweet little posture like I'm trying to model here right now because I'm engaged. We want to encourage you to be engaged for your family. 
Because the reality is we are at war. That is the reality. The Bible said, Nehemiah 4, fight for your family, fight for your home. We are at war. If you really believe that, if you believe the Bible as we're about to read, that we are at war, it changes our posture. We have a different posture, a different engagement than peace times, do we not? And the Bible's so good. God, is, God loves us so much. He doesn't just leave us out on our own trying to figure it out. Check out 1 Peter verse 5. Read it with me. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Already there's information. Be sober-minded. That means don't be dull. Don't allow a substance to dull your senses. Don't allow distraction to dull you. We've got to be sober-minded, watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Here God is peeling back the curtain of heaven, and he's letting us know that just because our physical eyes cannot see, it does not make it not true that we have an adversary. We have an enemy, and he is intent. He is active. He is prowling, looking for whom he can devour. When he knocks on the door of your house, are you vulnerable? Are you open to what he has in mind for you? He has a plan. If you go back to the beginning, Genesis chapter three, we see Satan with his eyes set on destroying marriage and he attacks Adam and Eve. And then just a few chapter or just a chapter later, Genesis four, we see him attack the family when the first brothers get into a terrible fight that ends in tragedy, ends in murder. That same enemy has the exact same heart for your family, exact same heart for your marriage. And it goes on, did you hear this? It says, resist him, firm in your what? Your faith, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You are not alone in this fight. Every Christ follower is in it with you. And here's the truth. Because we follow Jesus, because this book is our life, it's our guide, it's the voice of God that we follow. There will be situations in our culture, there will be rooms that you walk into in your schools, in your businesses, where there will be worldviews diametrically opposed to what the God of the Bible has to say. And there will be people and organizations in our culture and our world who resist, who resist. Nehemiah experienced resistance. Jesus said, if they hate me, they will hate you too. We have to have our eyes open, understand that there's a, a, a war and that you and I are in it, and that even on your best day, this is something that we have talked about in our marriage. Think about this with our enemy. Even on your best day, when your marriage is, I mean, going great, when you're treating each other so sweet, when romance is good, maybe there's peace in your house, it's the best day in your family, even on your best day, there is an enemy, John 10, 10, who has an agenda actively pursuing you and yours to steal, kill, and destroy. Does this lead us to fear and lead us to coward? No, it leads us to step out in faith. God says, I didn't give you a spirit of fear. I give you a spirit of boldness, power, love, self-control. Where We take out our weapons, our sword of the spirit, and we fight in Jesus' name. Fight for our family. Our enemy is planning for the fall of our families. That's his goal. He has an agenda, and your family is on his list. And we've got to move in Jesus' power. Ephesians 6 gives us another window behind the, behind the screen. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. There's such good news in that verse. It's not fun that we have an adversary, but the good news is you're able to stand. You and I are able to stand. There's nothing too big, too great, too threatening against your family that with the power of Jesus, we cannot stand, but we've gotta be ready to fight. So good, and there's a battle, this battle when it comes to families, there's a battle from the outside in, and there's a battle from the inside out. And we wanna start talk, first talk about the battle from the outside in. Things around you that you need to be seeing and recognize, oh, this is a strategy from the enemy to change the world and not in God's image. <clears throat> For example, the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. Today, there, I'm, I'm shocked that there's even a debate 
that it's even a talking point that we would be arguing if communism is an appropriate government that would uh, be healthy for, for our nation, that there are, there are people in Congress right now that would wholeheartedly subscribe to this, to this mentality, to this, stand, this uh, form of government. And, but communism is based off of Karl Marx, and within his manifesto, he had several demands. Inside of those demands is the abolition, quote unquote, the abolition of the family. I had uh, one of our new Keystone spiritual family members, one of our new servant leaders came up to me in, the, in between the two services, and he came up to me, he said, listen, I came from Romania, I lived under communism, and I lived in freedom. Nobody wants communism. It really does rip families apart. It, 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 it's not, not, it's no joke. Uh, what does it say in verse eight? They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to, the, and to cause confusion in it. I believe there's a lot of confusion in our culture right now. Let me point out a couple of things. First of all, there's a strategy to outsource our parenting. There's a strategy, and some of us right now are falling into this strategy, to outsource our parenting to the government, that would be the communism, to the government, to our educational systems, are you ready for this one? To our athletics. Okay, so somebody just got, ouch, right there. To the government, nanny state, to our educational systems, just teach my kid what they need to teach for life. We never, ever, ever had a vision that our teachers would be the parents of our kids. It is a burden far too great on their shoulders. Come on, let's honor some teachers in the house. It's, it's jacked up. Man. Anyway, and then coaches. I don't know if we're going to clap for this one. But are your coaches imparting values more than you're imparting values? I love sports, and I think they can aid in the values, but they should supplement what they're already learning in the house. Because here's what's going to happen. We're going to drop them off at school. We're going to hand off the keys to the car at 16. And then we're going to send them off to college. And then when we're empty nesters, we wonder why we don't have a close home. Because we have dropped off, we have handed off, and we have sent off, and we have not created a legacy that will last. In government, California, check this out, this is an attack. California Bill 1955, have you heard about it? Governor Gavin Newsom signed enthusiastically, wholeheartedly, spiked the ball when he signed the Assembly Bill 1955 into law this past month. It prohibits school districts in California from having policies that require teachers or staff to disclose a student's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression to the student's parents, check this, without the student's consent. Okay, so we have a government that's saying, don't talk to the, you can't talk to the parents unless the student gives you a written note. I remember when we always had to get the parents' written, written note for things in life, not the kids' written note. And see, what's happening here is something very, very powerful. I got back from Canada fishing, and I saw in the headlines our wonderful Keller ISD in the newspaper. Many of you attend, have kids that have, have attended or are attending Keller ISD. The board boldly put forth a policy that is the opposite of California Bill 1955. And they basically said, <laughs> and boy, they're, they're taking it, man. The, the people on that board are taking heat for this, but listen to it. It's basically teachers and staff are not allowed to go along or participate affirming a transition or pronouns of a child without the parent's signature. So do you see it? So we have... Sanity saying, hey, we're not going to over here participate in a child's transition and you don't know that this is happening at school because you're not here. In other words, they're saying parenting belongs in the family, teaching belongs at school. And they're taking heat, man. They're taking heat. Social media is another outside in, outside in. 
Did you know one in five youth experience unwanted online exposure to sexually explicit material and one in nine experience online sexual solicitation? One in nine. Let's wake up. More than 80% of child sex crime starts on social media. Our culture has no hope of improving as long as we allow the pornification of our young generation and the sexualization of our children. There's many as five million predators on the internet at any given time and about a half a million actively pursuing children and youth. We gotta wake up. Yeah, these are threats. And we're just pointing out a few, but as parents, as families, as people, we have to have our wide, eyes wide open to the outside threats. You know, just as a mom, honestly, as a therapist, that's what I do professionally. And as just a leader in a church, when we talk about sexual predators online and just the online just places that our children walk into, understand this. It's not a matter of if your child will experience these things in some form or fashion online. It's when. And so as parents, if we cannot, again, live scared or be shocked when it happens, but we can be ready, we can be on the offensive, we can be prepared for when we have those conversations. We're not shaming our children. We may lead them. We're disciplining them if that's required in the situation. But we are supporting them and we're walking to the God who heals because sexual sin like that, seeing pornographic images at developmental ages and stages, what it does, it wounds the heart of your child. There is a wounding that happens on the inside. And as parents, we've got it engaged because here's the good news. We know the God who heals all wounds. We know the God who heals our diseases. We know the God who repairs broken things. He raises dead things. And so rather than walking with fear, We walk in prepared, but that's the battle on the outside, and there's so much more, but there's also the battle, as you said, on the inside. You cannot mistake the battle on the inside, and again, this is that therapist hat in me, but often when I read the Bible and I come across passages that I'm about to read to you, I look at them through the lens of of a diagnosis. What we're about to read is a diagnostic passage that God in his goodness wants us to be aware of. Psalm 51, verse 5. It says, for I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Do you hear the language here? I was born a sinner. This is also beautiful language that God sees us in the womb and already is engaging with us. We already need Jesus before we're even born. He sees us, but we have a condition. I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb teaching me wisdom, even there. Have you ever thought about the God of the universe actively engaging with the soul of a baby in the womb? It's right there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. So there's the bad news of the diagnosis that from the moment of conception, I have a situation. Why is this important for families and for parents? Because we look at our little children and that little cutie caterpillar that's brought into our life and we're holding them and yes, they're innocent and precious, but they have a sin problem. From minute one, they have a sin condition. And what that means is, is that you and I have the opportunity to take them to the last part of this verse. We take them to the one who can purify them from their sin, who can wash them clean. But we have to understand the diagnosis of our soul. James chapter one describes it, that inside of us, that sin condition that you and I have, it's a desire-driven disease. It's a craving for something that we want. Often the thing we desire might even be a good thing, but we want it so much that we're willing to deny God to get it and reject him in the process, and that sin will destroy us. Every one of us has a flavor You have a different flavor and and draw to sin than the person sitting over here. In your own family, we have different flavors of the type of temptations that we're drawn to, but they all end in killing things we love and robbing us from the life that God has for us. Parenting hack for all of our parents in the room, whatever age and stage, don't sleep on the easy child. Like, what do you mean? Don't sleep. Don't rest with the easy child. Here's the picture I wanna paint for you. So in my mind, sometimes one child, it's like the fireworks child. I don't know if y'all have seen those videos online where like the kid puts fireworks in the outdoor grill and it goes off. 
I don't want anyone to get hurt, but I really enjoy those videos. And I'm just being full disclosure. No, as long as no one's hurt, but it just brings me a strange joy. Anyway, but sometimes in our home, imagine if one of your children lit fireworks in your house, right? That's very dangerous. Well, often we'll have a kid in our home and maybe they're the one filled with anger issues and they're yelling and they're screaming and they're sass and you see all the destruction. And you don't realize that this other little cute sweetheart of yours who hugs you, who gives you warm hugs, is sweet. I call them the unattended candle. They smell good. There's warmth. Sometimes you forget about it. And if you forget about that candle and you leave it burning, what's going to happen? It's going to burn your house to the ground. Whatever the personality or the presentation of your child All of us have a raging sin problem. That means that we as parents want to engage. We want to engage because we love them so much. And one of the greatest ways you can engage, this is so important, you cannot lead where you yourself are not going. So let's talk about you and me, mom, dad, you and me, person in the room. How's your sin condition? What are the things that you're craving? Where are you desiring? What are you feeding? What are you feasting on in the private spaces? I heard a quote, I posted it recently, I loved it, from Lisa Bevere. Listen to what she said. You will never have authority over the things you choose to be entertained by. We are choosing and allowing ourselves to be entertained by things that not only grieve the heart of God, they destroy lives, starting with yours. And we become dull in our entertainment as we watch these sexual things or as we watch a mockery of God or as we watch the opposite of God's design and how we have a good time and we watch and consume and wonder why we are dulled in our senses. And when it's time to fight, our posture is poor. God says, I want victory to start in your life and out of the victory in my life, I then can step and lead my children to victory. We're all going to blow it. We're all going to have moments where we skin our knees. But as Christ followers, we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and get back up in Jesus' name and walk in his design. And finally, when you talk about the battle from the inside, pray for your kids. That is not some in theory. That is not some, yeah, I need to pray for my kids. Parents, get on your knees. Cry out to God on behalf of your children, your family, your marriage. Let me ask you a question. If you're not praying for your kids, who is? If you're not praying and calling on the God of heaven to intervene on your child's behalf, who else is? Pray for your kids. If you're not praying for your family, the enemy will pray on your family. So we've got to be people who pray Deep prayer and silence is an enemy strategy. For you to be silent, not speaking up. Teach your kids your values. Teach your kids what you believe about the world around you. Talk to your kids about how you vote. Talk to your kids about uh, worldview. Talk to your kids about things you're seeing in entertainment. Just open up the dialogue. Silence is an enemy strategy. And, And silence is an enemy strategy for the church. That if we would be silent, the enemy is fine with a a silent church. A church that's not talking about this right now allows them to move in the darkness, but we're shining the light. Uh, Evil never stops itself. Evil never stops itself. And so understand, whatever you give evil, evil will take. And here's six strategies, and I'm gonna list these, and you can take a picture. Um, You can watch this again online, but there's six strategies. I'm gonna move quickly. You can look on this later, but Satan's six strategies. Number one, he twists the word of God. Number two, he disguises himself. Let the Holy Spirit begin to speak to you about which of these might be uh, moving into your life. Number three, he counterfeits. What God creates, Satan counterfeits. He attacks. So where is an attack in your home happening that may be a result of a strategy? He accuses. And then number six, he blinds. He blinds. So take a picture of that, but understand this. as, As you're capturing that, Know this, that we've got to embrace that we will be different than most other families in our community. You just got to embrace that, that that's going to be a reality. You will be different. Um, And just going back to the story of Nehemiah, you see in verse two, he said in the presence of his brothers in the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it all up in a day? And they began to mock 
Nehemiah and mock the Jews. And by the way, the, the wall that they were building, they said not, even if a fox were to, rock, were to crawl on that or walk on that wall, it's gonna fall down. It's so weakly uh, built. When we go to Israel, and we will go to Israel, when we go to Israel, as soon as we possibly can, when we go, we're gonna see this right here, Nehemiah's wall, and it's still standing. Yeah. Just yeah. a thought. It's a what, legacy that lasts right there. It's a legacy that lasts. So here's some thoughts, just quick, and we're gonna talk more about these in the book, and obviously more about these in this series, but that means that you gotta be counterculture with your technology. You do technology differently. Maybe you're a little slower to give it, or when you give it, you just have restrictions that maybe some of the other kids at school do not have. Um, dating, that we're teaching our kids. Dating is not entertainment. Dating is preparation for marriage, okay? So it's not just a game. Sleepovers, all of a sudden, and this is just for us to you, uh, with all of the pastoring and also the 20-year counseling practice, we know too much about the danger of sleepovers. And so you've gotta have your eyes open. If you allow them, they need to be with great restrictions. Um, priorities in sports. You need to understand if you're in an athletic home, and we love that, we encourage that, I think it's awesome. If you're in an athletic home, there will be a defining moment where you have to decide and you have to speak up. There will be a defining moment. Oh, we're gonna lose the scholarship. They probably weren't gonna get it anyway. So let's just, <laughs> let's just receive athletics for what it is. But you're the parent. You're not under the coach. You're the parent. Love the coach. Love the values that are being taught, but there may be a moment. And there's so many different ways that we fight for our families and fight for our children, but let's just list a few and just marinate on these. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you in your time. Take notes. Fight for connection. Genesis 3 or Genesis 2 verse 18, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. And so be parents that actively take away aloneness of the people in your home. Have those family dinners. Create a culture where there's intentional conversation and love one another in that way. Fight to break cycles. We're actually gonna talk about this at the parenting conference as our first message, really diving into generational cycles. You are not destined to repeat the broken cycles that you grew up in. You do not have to repeat those. Only Christ can break the cycle in your life. And we wanna look at that in depth. The reality is come to the conference, read mm. our book, and just a note on our book, we are so not perfect. We are so messed up. Our own book convicts us. We just all need Jesus. <laughs> but we want to be just absolutely equipped to follow him. There's so many more. Order, not chaos. Fight for peace in your home. Uh, but ultimately, Christ at the center yeah. of it all. Yeah. Um, the role of the church is indescribable um, that we have seen. And today, really, God has to be in the center of it all. So can we pray together? I just want to just ask the Lord to just Marinate these things on our heart as we move into our weeks and just ask God to really change some things that are, that are happening in our, in our culture and even in our families. Father, we pray that this would be a church that fights for families. And we know ultimately, though there are those that oppose you, God, and oppose your design for life, that they would even say of themselves, enemies, we know ultimately that we fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight against the principalities and the powers of darkness. And so God, we don't wanna to be tools of the enemy's strategy. We want to be tools of your strategy. We wanna be filled with the Holy Spirit, not the spirit of this world and the spirit of this age. So God, may we have that spirit. May we walk with grace, with a smile on our face, with love and compassion as we fight the battle for our families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.